So um, welcome everyone to the second edition of the QMR Meetup series. Um, so just a quick recap on, on what this QMR Meetup is. It's um, basically a small spin-off from the Quantum Open Source uh, Foundation uh, uh, program. So uh, a couple of us were um, mentors at this uh, QSF uh, mentorship program. And um, it, it turned out that there was quite some excitement and interest in uh, learning more about quantum, quantum computing and uh, quantum machine learning as well. But um, unfortunately, there weren't enough mentors. So um, it, it turned out it would be nice to have a, uh, a small uh, meetup series. So um, I believe you've uh, met uh, Arosa and Amira at uh, the last edition of this uh, QMA meetup. Uh, my name is Antal. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't make it for the first one, but uh, fortunately today I'm, I'm here. And um, yeah, uh, honestly, for, for this, uh, this series, uh, it wouldn't have been taking place if, if it wasn't for Francesco. Uh, we are getting uh, the sponsorship and, and also for uh, also getting the, the Zoom um, opportunity here. So it's really great to, to be able to, um, to share the, the meetup itself with uh, with lots of lots of people and hopefully to to inspire people to get into quantum computing and quantum machine learning. So today uh, it will be Dr. David Sutter giving us a, a talk on the power of quantum neural networks. So David is a, a postdoctoral researcher at IBM. He did a, a PhD at uh, ETH Zurich uh, in Renato Renner's group and um, one, one interesting thing I, I found out about David is that he comes from an electrical engineering background. So maybe this can be uh, inspirational and motivational for people who, who might not have a physics background or mathematics background, but would like to get into quantum information theory or quantum computing. So um, maybe if you have questions regarding this, just feel free to post those. Uh, another thing I, I, I uh, did manage to find out about David is that although he is an extremely humble person, he has a, a very, very uh, great uh, wealth of, um, of uh, knowledge in quantum information theory. So personally, I'm really excited about his talk. And um, just before getting into the talk itself, um, he also agreed to take questions throughout the talk itself. So we might, we might just interrupt with uh, relevant questions uh, here and there. So without further ado, David, please go for, go for your talk. Okay, thanks a lot, Antal, for the very kind introduction. Um, so let me share the slides quickly. Yes. Okay, I hope you can see them. Yeah. No, okay, perfect. Okay. Oh, here we go. Okay, so um, it's a great pleasure here to speak at this quantum machine learning meetup here. And um, I, I would like to present um, a, a result that we had with Amira, Krista, um, Aurelie, Alessio, and Stefan that are all from IBM or from ETH Zurich. And um, by a very nice coincidence, the, the work was just published today, actually. So if you, um, if you want to, to read it up, you can either look at the archive link here, or it's now also published in, in Nature Computational Science since today. That's a nice coincidence. And so um, let me start rather slowly with what was the vision um, where we started this project and try to put it into, into big context. So that the big dream that, that we at IBM and many other people have in quantum computing is that we would like to demonstrate a quantum advantage. So I'm, I'm sure most of you have, have heard what, what we mean by quantum advantage. So um, how I define it or how, how some people define it is that we would like to and find a practically relevant problem that we can solve faster or better with a current quantum computer than compared to the best classical computer with the best classical algorithm. And so um, I think this quantum advantage has not been shown yet because okay, all the problems where we could do this, they were not really practically relevant. So the supremacy experiments, for example. And as we probably also all know that um, showing such a quantum advantage this is very challenging to do. And I think it's challenging for various reasons, but um, for sure two reasons are all depicted here on, on this graph on the right-hand side. So um, what makes the problem complicated is that we need to find a problem that is hard to solve classically because otherwise you don't need a quantum computer, obviously. 
And at the same time, we want this problem to be such that we don't need a, a very large or fully fault tolerant quantum computer to solve because otherwise we cannot really run it today on current devices. And so, um, so this sort of brings us or this gives us at least two options how to make progress on this quantum advantage. One option would be to sort of make progress on, on lowering hardware requirements. So this would mean that we should improve error correction, fault tolerance, that we can do longer calculations and with, with less resources, so to speak. And the other option would be to go on search for new problems, which may be hard, to solve classically, but which can be maybe solved on, on small quantum devices. And in this talk, um, I would like to speak about the second approach here. So this talk, we, we don't touch error correction, but we want to sort of find new problems, which maybe scale in a very nice way on a quantum computer. And so I also would like to like make clear at this point already that in, in this talk, we are not talking about a provable quantum algorithm, right? Sort of, uh, we, we are not talking about an algorithm that is in, in the flavor of Shor's algorithm or Grover's algorithm where we can prove what is the runtime, um, but we are talking more about heuristic algorithms. So heuristic algorithms are algorithms where we cannot prove things about them, but we can test them on, on current devices and see how they, how they perform in practice. And um, the heuristic algorithm more concretely that we were focusing on is, is a, a very um, famous one. It's a, it's a neural network type algorithm. So here on the, on the left, you see a very simple classical feed forward fully connected neural network, which we characterize by three parameters. So an input size, an output size, and a, a number of parameters that we can then train. And we want to understand how this classical neural network would, um, how this would, sort of compared to a quantum mechanical version of this classical neural network, which um, can be seen here on the right. So this could be maybe seen as a, as a, as a network where we have a so-called encoding map or feature map. This is this map phi. So what is this doing? So it takes classical data X and it maps it into our Hilbert space on a certain number of qubits. So it maps the data into this state here, phi X. And then once we are in the Hilbert space, we perform a variation unitary. So this is a unitary that is again parameterized by a certain number of parameters. Again, D parameters, which are this theta vector here. And then we perform a measurement in the end, such that we get a classical, that we get a classical statistical model out of it. And the idea was um, to like try to understand as rigorously as possible whether the quantum version here of this of the statistical model, whether this has certain um, advantages. So I, I see that there are already questions. So I, I will not um, touch the questions right now, but if, if somebody can interrupt me, if there is an important question, please feel free to do so at any time. Okay. And maybe the, the last point here is that we, um, if you want now to do a comparison between this classical statistical model and this quantum quantum model, then we, we, we need to sort of compare equal things with equal things. So we say that the classical neural network and the quantum neural network, that they are comparable if they have the same input size, the same output size, and importantly, the same number of parameters. And hopefully the, 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 the motivation was that maybe because we are here in this, Hil in this Hilbert space in this very high dimensional space, maybe these um, quantum neural networks have certain, certain advantages or certain, certain properties which the classical models do not have. So let's try to, to attack this question. So if you want to understand whether these quantum models have certain, certain interesting um, properties, then we need to quantify um, like mathematically, how do we measure the power of a model or the expressibility or the capacity of a model? And there, this is of course a very well studied question and, and the very naive take on this would be just to count the number of parameters and then conclude that models with more parameters, they're more powerful. Now, of course, this is extremely naive and it's even wrong, I would say, because um, you probably already see that um, one could easily design um, like a classical neural network, which has certain parameters that are redundant. So then if we add redundant parameters, we would sort of increase the number of parameters, but the model clearly doesn't get more powerful because the parameters are redundant. So this is 
just counting the number of parameters is naive and imprecise. And so what we propose here is to, to use a refined version of this very naive approach to just count the number of parameters. So in some sense, we want to count the number of relevant parameters. And, and this is a measure that has been introduced in, in the literature, and this is called effective dimension. So the effective dimension in some sense wants to capture what is the number of parameters that are really effective, so that are relevant. And this is, um, and this effective dimension, I have another slide about it. So this is um, a mathematical quantity that is that is um, that has its origins in, in, in geometry and in, in, in other eras. So um, okay, here, here's just the overview slide. So this effective dimension is, is uh, has yeah, mathematical foundation. It's based on the mi minimum description length and called Mogorov complexity. So maybe we can um, spend one slide to sort of motivate the effective dimension better. But if you if you get lost, what the effective what the effective dimension is, is doing, then, then never mind. So just keep in mind that the, it, it tries to quantify the number of parameters which are effective, which, which are relevant. Um, David, so, yes. uh, so I can like interrupt with questions as they come along. Sure, right? sure, sure. So uh, the previous slide, there was a question that might be relevant. So here somebody asked if the connection among neurons is achieved through entanglement in the quantum model. So. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let, let me see that I understood this correctly. So, um, um, of course, there's entanglement. In, so, in, in, in the quantum model, of course, there's entanglement. So, so um, okay, there's entanglement on two on, on two um, point two eras. So, first of all, in this feature map or in this encoding map, so the the state phi x is, is a highly entangled state usually. So when we load the data into, into, our, into, our, in, into a state in our Hilbert space, then how we usually choose this mapping phi here is that we usually encode the classical data with, into angles of, of certain rotation gates. And this, um, this usually introduces a lot of entanglement. But we will see this um, concretely, how, how, how choices of this phi are later in the talk. And secondly, once we are here at this level, so we have a state, then if we now perform this variation unitary again, this variation unitary can um, introduce entanglement again. So um, I hope I answered the question. Yeah, thank you. Okay. okay, so, okay, this is, I think the only technical slide. And the idea was that I, I, I want to give some mathematical background on, on, on what the effective dimension is based on. So the idea is, is the following. So suppose we have a certain, a certain number of data. And then we could ask the very, um, yeah, um, the, the question that how do we choose now? Okay, if you want to have, okay, we, we are given certain data and we want to now find a model that describes this data. Then of course, this is a not well-defined question because there are lots of models that could describe or that could sort of explain the data. And then, um, then we need to choose which model is now the best one to take to explain the data. And of course, this is not well-defined as I said, but a very um, reasonable choice would be to go with the simplest model. So this is this Occam's razor approach that if you, if you have different explanations that explain something, then we should always go for the simplest one. Of course, it's very high level, so this can be now made rigorous. And this is made rigorous in terms of Kolmogorov complexity or Kolmogorov entropy. So the Kolmogorov entropy is, is unlike Shannon entropy, it's another type of entropy where we define the information content of a, a certain object, for example, this picture here. So this is this Mandelbrot set, then the Kolmogorov complexity or Kolmogorov entropy of this of this picture is just the, the smallest um, the smallest program that generates this um, this object here. And of course this Mandelbrot set is particularly simple because it has a very short it has a very short description or there's a very short source code that generates this picture. Now the Kolmogorov complexity unlike Shannon complexity or Shannon entropy has the drawback that it's in, in general we cannot really compute it. But, but of course we can use it to define things. And now we can, if you have 
certain date, then we want to find the model that explains this data, we can choose the model that has the smallest Kolmogorov complexity. And this then leads to what information theory people call the principle of minimum description length. So if you are given data and the choice of models, and um, then we choose the model such that the description of the model um, is as short as possible. And if one is doing the math, then you see that um, the model complexity under certain IID assumptions is given by these two terms here. And the idea of the effective dimension is that we just combine these two terms into a single expression. So this was done by Alessio Figalli um, one or two years ago, where he introduced effective dimension exactly as this rather complicated formula here. So if, you, um, if you're scared by the formula, you cannot digest it immediately, don't worry. I think what is important is um, that it, it's basically the determinant of this matrix F here. And this F is the Fisher information matrix. This is another information theory, theoretic quantity that describes the, the statistics of your model here. And as you can also see here, the effective dimension is nice because it, it works for finite data. So we have n, the small n is the, is the number of data samples. And now I don't want to spend too much time on this effective dimension. I just, um, you should, if you have still problems to digest the formula, just keep in mind that the relevant scaling is roughly the determinant of this Fisher information matrix, this F matrix. And what one can show is that the effective dimension is a, is a meaningful capacity measure for machine learning. So what does this mean? So this means um, we can show and prove that it describes the so-called generalization error. So the, the performance on unseen data is described by the, this effective dimension. It's efficiently computable. So we can compute it in practice because it's just a, a formula of this Fisher information matrix. And the Fisher information is not too complicated to compute this approximately, and it also works for finite data. And so now if you have this effective dimension at hand, we can go back to our original question that we had. So we have this classical statistical model, which we want to compare with the quantum neural network model. And we could now say that um, if the effective dimension is a, a meaningful capacity measure, then we could um, conclude that powerful statistical models have a large effective dimension. We could now compute the effective dimension for the classical model and compare how the effective dimension rel relates to the, um, to the quantum model, for example. Um, David, I had a question mm -hmm. actually. So sure. um, here we're just, um, so regarding this uh, minimum description length, the, the description essentially, you know, the language or description language could be mm -hmm. anything. Um, and that relates to the length that you pick, um, you mm -hmm. know, the complexity. Uh, so here you connect it to Fisher information, but that it's not necessarily, it doesn't tell you exactly what the effective dimension is, right? Like, it's just a way of looking at how, how many, um, uh, you know, uh, what is the minimum number of uh, hypotheses you need in, in your hypothesis class or VC dimension, or it could be any other uh, metric, right? That's right. I think it's correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, it's just one way of looking at this using. A yes. Picture. Yes. That's uh, so. Okay. Yes. I, I think that's correct. So. Um, yes. So. So I think what you also say indirect is that one could also consider modifications of this effective dimension where, where, where one doesn't work with the Fisher information matrix and maybe with another one. I, I think that's correct. Yes. Thanks. Okay, so, so maybe let me skip these two slides here to, to save a bit of time. So this was just an experiment that we did that, that tells us that the effective dimension actually correlates nicely with the generalization error. So we see on, on the left-hand side in a small experiment we did and we, we plotted the effective dimension and then we plotted the test error and we see that they sort of correlate nicely because they have the same shape. This was a numerical experiment to, to justify that the effective dimension correlates well with the generalization error. And then we also proved a so-called general, generalization bound. This is this um, yeah, mathematical formula here that you want to bound the generalization error, which is um, this object here with, with a function that depends on your capacity measure, which is the effective dimension. So this is this um, complicated formula, but maybe let's not let, let's not go into this and let's maybe come back if you have questions or if you have time at the end. So let's now go to the, to the experiments that we did as I, as I 
told you before. So we now took this effective dimension and we took the two um, statistical models that we, that we saw at the very beginning. So the classical neural network and the quantum neural network when we, we computed the effective dimension. So we are normalized such that it's always between zero and one. And I should emphasize here that we, um, of course, to be fair or to, to make a fair comparison, we were um, doing a brute force search about all possible classical neural networks that are um, comparable to the quantum neural networks, right? Sort of, if you remember, so I, we call models comparable if they have the same input size, the same output size, and the same number of parameters. So here, input size four, output size two, and 40 parameters. And now here we, we did, as I said, for the classical neural networks, we did a brute force search over all classical feed forward fully connected neural networks that have this, um, this triple of parameters. And we, we, we just tested all um, popular activation functions and, and, and all possible topologies and things. And we plot the, the best one here. So when we saw this, we were happy because it, it told us that really there's a there's a clear distinction between the quantum model and the classical model, at least in terms of effective dimension. So, so clearly the quantum model has a much higher effective dimension and therefore it's much more expressive. So then um, when we saw this plot, we, we wanted to better understand, okay, well, what is going on? And if you want to understand again, how the effective dimension scales, then you need to go back to the formula and again, it's the scary formula, but it, it really scales as the determinant of this Fisher information matrix. Now, um, the Fisher information matrix, so it has this head here, it's even normalized. So then um, we see that the determinant of a normalized matrix is, is, is I would say, large if, if the, the spectrum or if the eigenvalues are uniformly spread. And it would be, it would be small, the effective dimension, if, if some of the eigenvalues are very small and some of them are very large because small eigenvalues then hurt because the determinant is a product of the, of the eigenvalues, right? And so therefore we were plotting the spectrum of the, of, the, of the Fisher information matrix. And we saw indeed that the classical models, they have a very unevenly distributed spectrum. So they have some eigenvalues, which are very small and some of them which are rather large. However, the quantum model has a quite evenly distributed spectrum. So um, when we saw, uh, yeah, uh, sure. Sorry, uh, we just have a couple of questions. So um, there was a question uh, regarding um, the effective uh, dimension. So mm -hmm. uh, someone was curious if it's computed for a model or the recorded data. Um, sorry, can you say again? So if it's computed for model or the, I didn't understand the first part. Sorry. Sure, so uh, the question goes as, is the effective dimension computed for a model or the recorded data? Um, I'm not sure I understand the first part. So what does it mean? Is it computed for model? That's a good question. I, I would I would think maybe it's uh, regarding whether whether it's uh, it's a measure for the model itself or or for the data. Uh -huh. So, so from the data, like the the effective dimension, like is uh, dependent on the model that you choose. That's the question, I think. Uh -huh. Yes, I mean, of course, it depends on the model. It, so, 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 okay, so the properties of the statistical model is is encoded into the Fisher information matrix. So, if you if you change your statistical model, then the Fisher information changes and therefore also the effective dimension for two models which have, or for two different models is then different because the effective dimension is different. Now, um, um, if, if you say, um, yeah, yeah, okay, I, I'm still not sure I fully understand the question, to be honest, but, but it's a function of the Fisher information matrix and the Fisher information matrix um, has properties about your statistical model inside. So if you if you exchange your statistical model, then you have a different Fisher information matrix, and therefore you have a different effective dimension. Yeah, I think that answers the question. Okay. Uh, there are some more questions about this, though. Like, should we go now? Or? Yeah, sure, sure. So there's a question from Andrea. She's asking, does higher effective dimension mean that the quantum neural network is much more prone to overfitting? Oh, yes, that's a good question. Um, so, okay, I have, um, okay, this is still 
um, ongoing research, I would say. So, so naively, um, this could be the case. So, so, so this is a very relevant question and, and this could be a problem. So, so we know that at least classically, if you have, okay, in other words, um, if you just want to have models which have a very high expressibility, then this could lead to overfitting. So this is a very valid concern. Um, and, and maybe maybe we can wait until the end for the outlook and I can comment a bit on that. But, but I think it's, it's a valid concern and this could be the case. So I maybe want to emphasize again here that we are, we are in a very small regime still, right? So we have only 40 parameters here, where if you compare this to, I don't know, state-of-the-art classical machine learning, so there they have, I don't know, um, a couple of, of magnitudes more parameters. So I, I would say, because we are still in this very low regime, sort of the overfitting is maybe not yet a problem, but in the long term, having models which have a very high expressibility, expressibility could lead to overfitting. That's indeed the case. Yes. Thank you. Um, there, there seems to be a couple of more questions. So uh, Renato was curious, uh, should we expect the effective dimension to decrease as a function of input and output sizes? Um, decrease. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about the, the, the behavior of the input and the output. So, so, so something I can tell you, okay, now I'm sorry that I'm not answering the question, but something that one can prove and that, that you can also see here in the plot is that the, the effective dimension is, is increasing in, in n, in small n. So this is the number of data. And in the limit where, where you have infinite data, where small n is going to infinity, then it converges to the to the rank of the Fisher information matrix. So if the Fisher information matrix has full rank, then this would mean that here in this normalized picture that this, this curves here both they converge to one. And the cur convergence is extremely slow in general. Now going back to the question whether the effective dimension, how it scales in the input and in the output, input and the output size, this is not clear to me right away. Because I think this input and output size determines the model and so therefore, okay, I don't know how it's case in the input and the output source. Cool, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, then, um, let's continue and if there are other questions, happy to take them. So um, when we saw now that we have a, a separation between the quantum models, which are very expressive, which have a very high effective dimension and the classical ones, which are much less expressive, then we thought, okay, let's, um, let's um, sort of be more confident about it and let's try to vary the quantum model. In particular, let's consider a quantum model, which is in some sense more classical in, in, in the sense that we, that we choose the encoding map. So this is this feature map, this phi. So let's choose one that doesn't generate any entanglement and therefore can be simulated efficiently classically. So, so this maybe uh, answers a question that was that was asked before. So here on the on the upper half, so in this in the circuit here, you see um, the phi map. So this encoding map that we used for the for the green model, so the quantum neural network. So you see that this is a this generates a lot of entanglement. So we have here the, the, the classical data, which are these axes, which are um, inserted into the state via these, these angles here and these rotation gates. And then we have these C0 gates and, and so everything gets entangled. And so this is a rather complicated state, obviously here. Now, we, 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 okay, we considered a, a different quantum model where this phi map, this encoding map is, 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 a, is, is a product state here. So it's, just a very simple encoding map, which is classically efficiently simulatable and doesn't have any entanglement. So that is this mapping here. And then the intuition was that maybe the simple encoding map, because it doesn't generate any entanglement, maybe it's less, it's less, um, it has a lower effective dimension because it's more classical in some sense. So we can simulate this efficiently classical. But of course, remember that there's still a variational unitary. So this is still on the classical model, of course. And what we saw is that indeed our intuition was sort of correct. So if we 
make the encoding map simpler, then um, the model gets less expressive, but it's still better than the classical neural network. So this is this blue curve here, which is the quantum model with the simple encoding map. And um, finally, we were then also trying to scale everything up to understand, okay, how, how does this, um, be, or how, how do the models behave if, if you make the number of parameters larger? So you see, we started here with 60 parameters and then we considered 80 and 100 parameters. And what is interesting here is that the classical models, so the, the red models here, we see that um, this degenerate spectrum of the eigenvalues, this gets worse and worse if you scale it up. So some of the eigenvalues get very large and many of them are extremely small. So this in other words, the Fisher information matrix for the feed forward classical neural networks has an extremely bad condition number. And this is this is very well known um, in the classical community, and this is a problem. Maybe we, we will hear more about that later. But quantumly, you see that what, what is exciting is that um, the green, so the, the quantum mod, quantum neural network, it stays more or less constant. So the spectrum doesn't really change if we scale up the model. And now this is potentially nice because um, as I said, so classically it's known that this feed forward fully connected neural networks, they have a very bad condition number of the fissure. And this is a problem because um, for certain loss functions and um, the condition number of the fissure information matrix um, controls how fast your training algorithm converges. And now because the quantum, the quantum models have such a nice condition number. We were hopeful that maybe they train better than the classical models. And this was indeed what we could um, demonstrate numerically. So we trained um, the models and we saw that the quantum model, they train much faster and much better. So, so this is an other advantage. So maybe, um, maybe um, I can, okay wrap up here and say, say a couple of words for, for future research that I think could be exciting. So um, of course we didn't demonstrate now a quantum advantage, not at all, but we, we, we showed hopefully that um, there's potential that quant certain quantum neural networks model, at least they can be very different than the classical neural networks and different could be, could be good because um, in, in particular, it looks like the quantum models, they can be more, more expressive and they can train better. So these are two very um, yeah, motivating properties that, that I think make it worth to study these um, quantum neural networks better or in more, or in more detail. So in particular, it would be interesting to, to better understand, okay, what are good encoding maps? So we just um, considered some of these five maps, but but maybe it's, it could be interesting to, to understand in, in a better way what are good encoding maps and what are good variational unitaries. Another problem is that that now relates to exactly the question that was asked before. So classically, we know of course very well that there's a trade-off um, between um, <clears throat> the generalization error and the training error. In other words, that, um, it, it's not beneficial to just maximize or to choose models to maximize the capacity because they can lead to overfitting. So this is called capacity control. And what you want to, to find is, 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 is the, in some sense, the optimal capacity um, where you have sort of a small, a small training error and the generalization error is, is, is also low in the sense that it doesn't shoot up if you, if you go to higher capacity. So you want to have this, this optimal capacity here that is, is then doing, yeah, that the fitting here well, and, and of course not overfitting. And this is something we, we need to better understand. And in particular, there's also something related um, to this capacity control, which is still a, a big mystery as far as I know, also in the classical machine learning community, which is in deep learning, right? Sort of naively from this picture here in the middle, one would, one would assume maybe that if you go to very deep neural networks where you have lots and lots of parameters, then the generalization error could be extremely bad because you overfit like crazy. However, for many models, this is not what we observe. So, so many, for many models, we observe a so-called double descent behavior of the generalization error. So we, we see that the generalization error goes up and then if you if you go to deeper and deeper models and at some point it decreases again. And this is, I think, not understood um, very well. And, and, and maybe also the effective dimension here can help us to shed new light or get a better understanding on this. 
with this, I think I want to conclude and I'm happy to take more questions. Um, so I can go, there is a question from Andrew. He's asking, do you use any measure of entanglement to quantify how much entanglement each encoding produces? Um, no, we, we, we did not. Um, I think this has been done um, in, in the past by other, other um, people. I think Patrick Coles uh, and, and colleagues have a, have a work that did that. Um, we didn't do it, but um, yeah, this would be maybe interesting. Yeah, we didn't do it. But I, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that, so, so maybe you're asking that sort of one could, okay, one could maybe hope that if you choose encoding maps, files here that have to generate more entanglement, that this would be better or something like this. I'm not sure this is true, but, but okay, it would be interesting to, to analyze this. Um, so I think there's just one confusion or maybe detail about the experiment. So somebody asked, what particular problem did you plot this effective dimension plot that you were so showing with uh, respect to the classical neural network? I think it was classification, right? Ah, yes, that's right. Yes, it's a, it's a binary classification task. Mm -hmm. So there's another one. I don't see how the quantum part in quantum neural network leads to a larger effective dimension. You could choose your activation functions in the classical neural network to emulate the quantum neural network. Will the classical neural network and quantum neural network have the same Fisher information? Can you please elaborate? <laughs> okay, that's a tricky one. Um, um, so I, I, I don't think that this is, okay, let me, how do we have the comparison of the two models here? So I, I, I don't think that, um, okay, so, so, okay, let me try to understand that I got the question correctly. So I, I, I don't think that you can, with, with a proper or a careful choice of, of, the, of the elements here in this classical feed forward fully connected neural net. Oh, okay, okay, so I understood the question as follows. So, so, um, Maybe it could be possible that if you choose, so given a certain quantum neural network, then there's a, a, there is a corresponding choice um, for the elements in the classical neural network such that you have the same model actually, quantumly and classically. And I think this is not the case, right? Because here we have another degree of freedom, right? Sort of here we, um, we, we encode our classical data into, into, the, into the exponentially large Hilbert space with, with a certain number of qubits, which actually we didn't, I didn't even say how, how many qubits we chose. And so therefore, so, so now we are, we are here in, a, in an exponentially large space where we perform a variation unitary. And this can be, a, of course, a very complicated unitary. So I think it's, it's obvious, or I think it's, it's rather clear that in, in the quantum model here, there, there are things, or we can model things that you cannot do classically. Whether this, whether this model is then a useful one or it can, can give us any, adv any advantage, this is not clear. But I think it's, it's clear that it's not possible to take a quantum neural network and um, model it classically. I think this will not work. So in other words, you cannot find a classical model that has the same feature information matrix always as the, as the quantum model. I think this is generally not possible. So would it like hold if we make, uh, if we change the input size and number of parameters for the classical classical one, then it may be some- Ah, uh, yes, then maybe, maybe it's maybe maybe that's possible, but there's probably an exponential scaling, right? Sort of you need them probably, I don't know, it scales probably very badly then. Yeah. Yes. And David? Yes, sorry. sorry. Can, I, can I also just add, because I think the last question was actually, um, you can choose activation functions such that mm -hmm. you end up with a desirable Fisher spectrum. So like, I think the person was kind of saying that maybe certain activation functions cause this, um, this weird uh, spectrum, which is not desirable for the effective dimension. So I guess, um, uh -huh. yeah. yeah, does that make sense? Yes, but, but okay, I can maybe to, to save, to save us, I can say that we, I mean, we considered many different activation functions, right? And we plotted the best ones. So, Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And and I think these nonlinearities is exactly what causes the shift in the spectrum. So so it's it's the root, yeah, it's the root cause. So that's probably also something worth mentioning. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Amira.
Maybe um, we or should we take one more question? Um, it's up to you. Uh, yeah, there seems to be a question regarding uh, slides 22 and 23. If the quantum neural network and the easy quantum model differs only in the encoding part, then is it okay to conclude that the effective dimension and the expressibility of the model depends more on the encoding part? Oh, yes, it's a good question. Um, yes, this is um, something that was not totally obvious to us and we did so, so, so some more research on this and I think um, it looks like, okay, right now it looks like that indeed the encoding or this feature map is, is actually much more important than the variational unitary. But, but I think there is still more research needs to be done to sort of make a precise rigorous statement. But I think the intuition is maybe correct, I would say, right now. So encoding is more, maybe more important than the variational unitary. Cool. Thank you. Uh, another one, is there a sample complexity analysis to see if the number of measurements needed to extract information from the quantum neural networks is better behaved as a function of the effective dimension than it is as the function of the total dimension? I'm, I'm not aware of something like this, but this, I mean, it's a very interesting question. So um, I think the effective dimension is a, is a rather new capacity measure. So it has been introduced in this paper by Alessio Figalli and, and, and others, um, maybe one or one and a half years ago. And then I think our work here was maybe the first one that used this effective dimension to, to do something with it. So um, I think it, okay, the, the, the question that you just asked, um, okay, I think it hasn't been analyzed. Maybe it's not so complicated to do, but I cannot tell you right now whether whether this, this is correct or not. So I would have to look into this. Sure, yeah, definitely. Um, there was another question quite, quite early on, but um, it's rather uh, general uh, for, the, for the field itself, I would say. Is there an analysis for uh, when we can't assume uh, independent and identically uh, distributed samples, uh, that is machine learning for time series prediction. Um, okay, sorry that I always have to, to ask again. I'm not sure I fully understand. Okay, so what was the question that, um, that there are certain um, scenarios where we don't have the IID assumption and then maybe this, um, the whole analysis we present doesn't work. I believe so, yeah. I believe okay. that. Would, yeah. So, so I, I think the IID assumption is rather crucial to all, all we did. So, so um, okay, sorry for jumping around. So um, you could see already here. So I think um, the effective dimension in some sense is only properly defined or motivated if you have IID assumptions. Otherwise this model complexity, uh, okay. If you have not IID assumptions, then I think I'm not sure the effective dimension is a meaningful measure. So, um, um, okay, sh short answer, if, if you don't have IID um, data, then, then I would be very skeptical to, to do like, okay, what we did, I'm not sure what we did, then is a, is a, is a justified analysis. Yes. Cool. Uh, yeah, someone actually, uh, Renato, he just uh, commented that, for example, in recurrent neural networks, uh, we, we can't assume IID. Mm -hmm. So um, perhaps uh, that might be something that is not completely compatible or? Yeah, so at least one needs to think more about it and, 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 uh, and justify carefully why it's still compatible. So, so, okay, I don't want to rule out, maybe one can make it or one can justify it even in a, in a setting which is not IID, but at least it's not totally obvious. Um, so I think one needs to be very careful if it things are not IID, but maybe it still works, I don't know. Cool. So, uh, there is a question about barren plateaus. So they are asking if you investigated uh, this, uh, this scenario in your experiments, if you know, mm -hmm. it changed the number of qubits and gates and see what happens. 
Um, so, so we were indeed trying to investigate parent plateaus a bit. So, um, um, because, okay, we, we know that there are problems, um, that there, there are problems like um, for quantum neural networks. And then we saw that, that our, our classical model trains well, then, then we were trying to link um, the fact that in case of a model that has a, that has a Fisher information matrix that has a nice spectrum, then I think you can um, make an argument that these models then do not suffer from barren plateau. So in other words, another nice consequence um, of this nice spectrum is that these models do not have barren plateaus. Um, Yes, likely, but but um, okay. I think this whole barren plateau is still confusing me a bit. So I, I I think I yeah, this needs to be investigated further. But I think what one can say, um, based on 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 what we did, I think it's also in the paper that if you have a model that has a uniformly distributed spectrum or evenly distributed spectrum, then um, these models will with with very high probability not suffer from barren plateaus. And this is also what you see here in the training. So if, if there would be barren plateaus, it would not train so well. Thank you. So maybe we take a couple more questions and uh, we let you relax a little bit. <laughs> um, so there is a question about, uh, more questions about data complexity, but I don't think they're really related to this talk so much because you use a fixed sample size and uh, and then you calculate the fish information and the effective dimension for that particular number mm -hmm. of uh, samples. So if uh, maybe I just, you know, give a shout out to the next talk, we'll be talking about sample complexities and mm -hmm. how data affects uh, what we do with quantum machine learning. So maybe, yeah, just say that uh, we will be tackling this question more next time. Um, but yeah, if you have any comments on that you're so welcome to share like people are asking if there are any like uh you know what happens if you change the sample size and yeah i i, I don't think that i have um many deep things to say about this so maybe i yeah maybe i i also listen to talk next week and then <laughs> let's see yeah. okay. intel do you want to go with any question um there seems to be uh Two smaller questions. One was uh, related to um, what feature map uh, works better for what kind of data set, or uh, can we get something uh, which works well irrespective of all these data sets? Not quite sure if you've gathered anything there, but maybe maybe you would have something. Yes, I mean this is one of the key open questions I, I, as far as I understand it in, in quantum machine learning, right? Sort of the search for good feature maps is, is a very tricky one. And I think um, it's not very well understood yet. So um, of course the, 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 the dream would be to have a, a feature map that works well for, um, for, yeah, for most data, right? So as classically, there's this Gaussian kernel, right? Which works incredibly well for, for many data. So, so quantumly, I think it's still not clear how to choose, how, how, yes, what, what are good feature maps? So, so there was a, a result also by IBM, by Christian Temme and others where they, where they gen so you can always generate data and basically do reverse engineering, fix a feature map and then generate the data. It's a very specific data that then works extremely well for this specific feature map. So what Christian did is he, he chose Shaw's algorithm or discrete logarithm for this feature map and then generated data that if you have now this very specific feature map, then you can classify like extremely well, for example. So in other words, I think we, we, we know for very specific data sets, we, we know good feature maps, but unfortunately, as far as I know, we don't know universal good feature maps. And this is, um, I think, a major open question. So there were also um, approaches by, I think, Maria and Seth Floyd, where they try, tried to train also feature maps to sort of, um, to use machine learning itself to find good feature maps. And this also um, worked partially, I would say, but it's still, I think it's still one of the key um, open questions to find if they are um, universal good feature maps and how do they look like? And of course we couldn't, okay, our work couldn't solve this, unfortunately. 
Thank you, David. So um, I don't know, should we wrap up and go to our uh, the slides to for the next week and the shout out? I think I think that sounds sounds great. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much, David, for for the talk. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for all the questions and. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, we share our screen, Anton. We can just show like, uh, you know, an advertisement for the next week. Sure. So in the meantime, thank you everybody for attending. Thank you, David, for the wonderful talk. Uh, there still are some questions, but I think if, if we upload the video and they, you know, go through it again, it'll be probably also if they go through the paper itself. Um, they will probably be happy with that. So next week we'll have Robert with us, the dear friend. So uh, all the questions about sample complexity and if there are any advantages and you know, um, would we always have the scenario that, uh, uh, or if it's true that classical computers or quantum, classical machine learning can never catch up to quantum machine learning, this, like, this is the debate for next time. And I would, yeah, I welcome you guys to join next time. And David, you as well, if you have time. Sure, sure. Uh, yes. Robert on these <laughs> really tricky questions. So yeah, thank you so much everybody for joining. And thank you, David and Francesco um, for, for being here. So we'll see you guys next, uh, next time. So this will be in two months. We're doing this every two months. So this will be in August. And uh, yeah, I look forward to your, your questions and trying, you know, uh, to understand all of this a bit better together. And uh, yeah, see you next time. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.